All right, welcome everybody, thank you. So we know that this is a, a very tight schedule at the Champ Retreat, and we're just coming off of a little Afrofuturism of traveling to 2035 back to 2022. Uh, so wherever you are uh, with that, maybe we'll just pause and just take a deep breath. And just know wherever you are, you're right here. And that's most important. So there's going to be schedules that are laid and we're hustling. Should I be here? I don't want to be in that session. There's a lot of different topics. Uh, but we really appreciate you being here. Uh, I know this is also being live streamed because this was a popular topic and long overdue in the B Corp community. Uh, so thank you all for tuning in. There's a lot of other sessions for you all to be at as well. Uh, I appreciate this challenge and opportunity for me to be here to host this conversation uh, for someone who comes from settler, invader, ancestry, white person, uh, but I'm very passionate uh, about this topic, so I appreciated one person on the stage was saying like, no, Andy, you do this. You come up. You host this. Uh, we, I'm Andy Fife. I'm from B-Lab US and Canada. I'm our director of equitable growth, and I'll do a little kind of level setting, place setting for where we are. So obviously we're in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, this is the original and ongoing land of the Lenape. Uh, they were forcefully removed. They were roughly, they were here for roughly 10,000 plus years. They were known as the caretakers of the river of human beings, which is now the Delaware River. Uh, unfortunately, Pennsylvania is one of 13 states in the US that doesn't recognize Native American tribes. There is a lot of work being done in Swarthmore College around teaching the Lenape language. Uh, there's a program at Penn to recruit and retain Native students. Uh, and Philadelphia just celebrated their uh, second annual Indigenous People Celebration, a lot of teach-ins from professors uh, around this work. So I think important with land acknowledgement to celebrate a lot of the, the good work that's being done and the inclusion, the involvement in the agency and that self-determination uh, that needs to be had. Uh, with that, I'm gonna make mistakes up here. I might have already said something that someone maybe knows differently. Uh, I invite you all to speak up and have a dialogue about that. We've already done that a lot in our pre-planning calls, uh, which I think has been a really sweet spirit of uh, putting each other in check, most notably me. Uh, so I'm honored to be here. Appreciate y'all giving me the opportunity. Uh, and uh, with that, I will pass to our panelists to introduce themselves and what we're talking about today. So with that, we'd love to hear your name, uh, what you're doing, your company or your involvement. Uh, and then also, when did reconciliation become personal or professional for you? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's such an honor to see many, so many beautiful faces and to spend time together here. My name is Annie Corver, and I am a daughter, a sister, an auntie, a mother, a partner. I am a visitor here. I'm a member of the Métis Nation in what we now call Canada, and I'm the founder and principal of RISE Consulting. And at RISE, we focus on the rising presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada. And we're looking forward. We have a vision where one's rights and well-being don't come at the expense of someone else. And, and I can't help but feel at home here. The exercise this morning was so invigorating. And I'm so pleased to be here. And it's been a decade since I had the aha moment. Um, I was actually doing some graduate work at the University of Calgary. And, and I was looking at the intersections with, with rights. And, and in, in Canada, what we call Canada today, Indigenous peoples are rights holders. It's a little bit different than in the US. And rights are protected. And, and as I was learning about the intersection between rights and project development, namely in the energy industry, I was studying this. And I was studying the intersection with economics and this notion of economic reconciliation. And so I'll share from that lens today. And, and you'll hear from me a little later today as well at 4 o'clock. Um, and I'll pass it to my friend Karen. Nanin Nipimenwanda Wigwak Natishnakas Dokis Nadonchi. I am Girl of the Clear Water. I'm from Dokis First Nation. My name is Karen Restool, and it's a pleasure to be with everyone here today. Um, I love the opening sentiment that Andy shared. It's one that I think we should all lead with 
And of course, I think how we got started today was with humility. And I'll talk a little bit more about the role of hum humility in reconciliation. I like to think that it's the fuel to the reconciliation vehicle. Um, and that's how, for the most part, um, my community, my people have guided themselves over, well, since forever. Um, and it really is at the root of how we try to li live our lives. Don't get me wrong, Indigenous people do make mistakes too. Um, we try to exercise those val that value and other values in everything that we do. And I think it's just so central uh, and necessary if we're going to talk about righting wrongs, if we're going to talk about paving a new road forward. So absolute pleasure to be with you here this morning. Miigwech. Miigwech, Karen. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Jay Wall. Uh, I'm also grateful and privileged to be here. Um, I'm not an indigenous person myself. I'm a 10th generation white settler of mixed European ancestry. I grew up um, not too far from Cairn in uh, the traditional homelands of Nipsing First Nation near North Bay, Ontario. Uh, and now the place I call home is Guelph, Ontario, um, traditional territory of the Attawandaran and most recently the Mississaugas of First Credit. Um, so as a settler, engaging this conversation is really important for me to um, keep in mind the privileges and ways that I've benefited from these themes of colonization that we'll be talking about today um, and uh, hoping to move forward in a good way. Uh, the organization I work with, uh, I'm Principal Creative Director at BrightWeb. Uh, BrightWeb is a creative agency dedicated to social change. So we do a lot of branding, websites, campaigns, uh, working with organizations uh, like yourselves who are doing good in the world. Um, and I've kind of been on a reconciliation journey for about uh, 10 years since I first um, had the privilege of engaging with Canadian Roots Exchange uh, on some uh, cultural uh, experiences uh, for youth. And it's really just become more clear to me in the last few years, especially as someone who helps shape visual culture. Um, what is my role as a creative director, guiding our creative team, uh, engaging with uh, Indigenous creatives as well uh, as part of that journey. So hope to share more with you, but I'll leave it there for now for the intro. Thank you. All right, well, thank you all. I think some people just uh, trickled in. So hi, Sean, hi, Emmy, hi, Ryan. Not to call you out, <laughs> but welcome. Uh, all right, cool. Well, let's, let's, we got donuts here. So as I said, I couldn't get these orange sprinkles on the donuts, but the intention was to have some orange donuts here. And I, we didn't have this happen in the US during Indigenous Peoples Day, but it sounds as though in Canada, there was a campaign around orange donuts uh, being sold with the proceeds maybe going to a good cause. Did that? intersect at all with your work? What was that like? Was that a little controversial? Did that come off a little performatism? <laughs> Karen, looks like you want to talk about that. Yeah, so the donuts is something that I wrestled with uh, in an article that I wrote for The Hub Canada. So go to thehub.ca, I'm a contributor there. Um, in the course of drafting, of putting together my article, I reached out to my editor and said to him, you know, I really want to talk about the orange sprinkled donuts that Tim Hortons is doing Apparently, this is a controversial thing. How many Canadians in the room? Can we? OK, so Canadians, you probably saw Tim Hortons do the orange sprinkle donut. September 30th in Canada is Truth and Reconciliation Day. It's a day that's been marked by the federal government to recognize uh, the histories, the shared, the darker chapters, the great parts of our shared history uh, between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, and, and really focus Canadians on the act of reconciling that past and paving a new way forward. And everyone contributes in the way that they can. And earlier this year, I, I shared uh, at a conference and said, uh, at a, the Western uh, B Lab conference, and encouraged everybody to do what they can to move the dial on reconciliation within their hug range. And you can either literally you know, hug people and reconcile that way, that's fine. I love hugs, I love giving them, I love receiving them. Um, but really, it's, it's doing what you can within your own individual space, that sense of personal responsibility and commitment to advancing things, making things better, to what you do at an organizational level, in the companies that you work for, or the organizations that you work for, you're engaged in, nonprofit, for-profit, whatever, look at your mandate and see what you can do. And so Tim Hortons went ahead and did an or orange sprinkle donut with all of the proceeds going to indigenous organizations that have for a mission to restore 
and revitalize indigenous ways of being uh, to address intergenerational harms. And a large swath of people were criticizing, well, you have to do more than buy the orange sprinkle donut. And I say to that, and it's a, a bit, become a bit of a controversial opinion. After I published my article, I had a bunch of people like, fill, you know, s like storm the comments and tell me I'm bupkis. But, um, but I think like for Canadians who don't interact with Indigenous peoples or communities or nations on a day to day, but everyone's going through the Timmy's line. If you buy that donut, that is your small way and perhaps the first step in a long-term, lifelong engagement with learning about what happened, but more importantly, sorting out within yourself how it is that you can contribute to moving the dial on reconciliation. So when we were chatting about this, <laughs> I was like, we gotta do, you know, it brought up the orange sprinkled donut, and Jay's like, we're buying donuts for this session. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I think I could find some donuts. This is <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, great. Well, I'm going to do like a very quick little uh, level setting for the U.S., a little bit of context, and um, I'll call you out, but Lacey, thank you. We've had a few conversations before this conversation. Uh, this is Lacey Horn from Native Advisory and her colleague Brandy. Um, and so we want to at least talk about some of the progress and representation, at least here in the U.S., uh, from an institutional level or from uh, in, our, in our office, in our government. And so I think right now we have uh, six House representatives who are Indigenous Americans. Uh, one, Palota in Alaska, which was re-elected last week, which was a huge accomplishment. Uh, and then two, uh, Congress, uh, Indigenous women uh, in this country. I think the challenge or the opportunity here for our conversation is, is the business community keeping up with that representation, recognizing that people need representation. Young people need to see people who look like them coming from their community to see that path forward. Uh, and so that's the conversation we're going to be having today. Is a little bit of level setting soon about Canada. Uh, and unique history and what's happening, uh, but then getting into the conversation of what is the role of business to really weave not just reconciliation but truth uh, and maybe as an example the form of rec a reconciliation action plan uh, that some of the Canadian B Corps have really exemplified and taken a first step towards. Uh, so with that, uh, Annie and Karen would love to pass to you to help us kind of level set on Canada, a little bit of historical context uh, for some of the folks here who maybe aren't as familiar. Yeah, so Last summer, uh, many, if not most in the room, would have seen the headlines on the rediscovery of the human remains in and around institutions we call residential schools uh, in Canada. These are not uh, institutions that are um, specific or exclusively to, Can to Canada. I know that across the US, there are also a number of schools in which uh, indigenous children were forced to attend and forcibly removed from their families to attend. And last summer we had, uh, and I think in large part, the pandemic had a role to play in, in really pushing society to pause and be forced to look at and consider um, truths, hard truths, like the human remains that were found of, of children across the country. And that really launched us into, when I say we as, as Canadians, as Canada, into a hard look at ourselves in our own backyards as to what exactly had happened here. And Canadians went through a pretty considerable process in processing this. I had a number of, of non-Indigenous friends reach out to me uh, to ask, uh, you know, what am I missing here? Where do I go learn more? Uh, and more importantly, what do we do about this? And we're talking about that long-standing history of colonial oppression and assimilation through pretty robust policy framework, uh, both in Canada and the US, where we really saw um, European uh, settlers, uh, explorers come across and look to establish themselves here in North America and issuing a bunch of policies that pushed indigenous people out of the way in order to give way to Western expansion. And with those policies became, over the years, just more and more intrusive as to what the government of the day, of those days, would do with indigenous peoples. Do we segregate and oppress and push them aside, which was the initial goal of those policies? 
and later on was, well, no, let's integrate them and force them to learn our language, cut their hair, uh, take on our traditions, protocols, religion, and way of life. And we now know we're at that point of time in history where we're sitting here and we're going, wow, that was a really bad idea. Like, look at the mess that we have now. Because surprise, indigenous people uh, are very resilient and we continued to push on and push forward and stand strong and we are here today. And so we're really seeing within that policy framework a, a slow dismantling, large conversations probably in large part due to the push at the United Nations level by indigenous people across the world for the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. A revitalization of language, culture, traditions, ways of life, life laws, governance systems, and whatnot. Um, and looking to Canada and other uh, mainstream governments and saying, you know what, your agenda didn't work, uh, and here's what you're now going to do. So a rise in sovereignty and self-determination is really guiding the way. And that's where, that, and that's where we are here today. But Annie's gonna fill the gaps. <laughs> that was really good. Uh, you know, just a couple of keywords, you know, sovereignty, self-determination, understanding what those terms mean, those concepts, those constructs is really important. And, and really when we go back and we think about, actually there was a comment in the, in, the, in the experience this morning where she talked about, you know, there's no borders. And that is such a powerful thought um, that they're one, that we're one global people. This notion that you know pre-contact in the late 1400s, you know under under the issuance of papal bulls, you know this this concept of the of the doctrine of discovery, you know that indigenous peoples were living and thriving in what we now call Canada, and it's really come forward from there. But it's important to understand, you know, sort of these early these early laws, these these early policies. Um, they really shape the way um, things have moved forward. And so, you know, in, in Canada, we had this, the largest class action lawsuit in 2008 um, with the residential school survivors, and then the creation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission led by the Honorable Murray Sinclair. And through that process of listening, really understanding the reality, the truths, you know, and our elders teach us that there is no reconciliation without truth. You know, in reconciliation, you know, we, we talk about what does that mean to us? And, you know, for me, it's relationship. And, 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 and to reconcile means that something has been broken. It wasn't broken, but it's broken now, and we have the agency and the influence to be part of shaping the future. And so when we understand where we've been, we can have a vision for where we want to go, and we can lean into the work done by commissions, such as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the final report, the 94 calls to action, calling us to be part of reconciliation, to make space for. You know, we're guided by the 10 principles for reconciliation. I gave Andy a gift this morning, and, and under those 10 principles, we're guided. It's a framework. Principle number five, let's close the socioeconomic gap that exists between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. Earlier this year, we had a reconciliation barometer report come out in Canada, and you know, economics is my background, so immediately I like pull down the, pull down the report, and I'm thinking it's, it's going to be completely focused on economic pieces, but it wasn't. It was focused on truth and the gap that exists right now in the knowledge that we hold. And so as you buy the sprinkled donut, take a minute and reflect, why is it orange? Why is Timmy's raising dollars? Because that's the impact that we get to be part of as we move forward. Thank you. Uh, I was invited to <laughs> attend the B Corp Leadership Development Conference in Canada. Um, so thank you, Michelle, and other mm -hmm. folks who are involved in that. Uh, and one thing that was talked about was a reconciliation action plan. I had no idea what it was. And so as someone who focuses on equitable growth for US and Canada, my bad. Uh, but I came away from that really inspired to see some of it being put into action. Uh, how many people have heard of a reconciliation action plan in this room? Cool. 
Um, so with that, I think it'd be helpful for us to know what it is, uh, and then we'll start talking about some of the tenets and the ingredients, and then maybe some of the learnings and best practices that you all have learned by putting one together at your certified B Corp. And maybe we'll start Annie or Karen to talk about reconciliation. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay, sure. <laughs> okay, great. So thanks for the show of hands. Great question. Um, you know, it's not, who's, who has a business plan, an operations plan? Who's running a marathon next year and you have a running plan, right? You know, a reconciliation action plan isn't dissimilar in that, you know, it's a framework, you know? And it really, um, I, I laugh about, you know, Simon Sinek, this guy, you know, he's super famous and he's always talking about the why. Well, the why is really important, but no, come on, let's start with the who. So really, the intent with the Reconciliation Action Plan is to center the voices of Indigenous peoples and to consider how you can be in relationship, how you can move forward and participate actively, proactively, with accountability as it relates to reconciliation. And so those components of the Reconciliation Action Plan allow you to start with a vision. You know, and at RISE, when we work on these, we ground ourselves in values. I'll chat more about that later this afternoon, but you think about what do I value? Who am I? What are my values? And how does reconciliation intersect with that, with those? And then as you create your vision for, you know, this, this, this ability, this future, not unlike the exercise that we just did, what does that look like for your organization, for you as an individual? as that aligns with your mandate. Karen just mentioned this. And so as you create this plan, you know, you create this vision, this commitment statement. You create objectives and goals, you know, ideal future states, you know, back to the marathon. Are you looking to run a sub four or not? <laughs> You know, in that reconciliation action plan, you get to co-create this with your team to actually workshop, write down, spend time in circle, reflecting on conversations that you've had with Indigenous peoples, research that you've read, conversations that you've been part of, as you then create tactical items, a work plan, one year, two year, five years, with KPIs, metrics. You know, what does that impact look like for you? You know, as you advance and participate in, as you ground yourself in truth, how can you commit to ongoing listening and learning to continue to participate? And so the wrap becomes a guiding document. You know, it becomes something that's co-created in your organization that your leadership, your board of directors is accountable for. You know, you sit in circle with the indigenous peoples that you've worked with to work on it with or, or that you've co-created it with. And you check in on it, just like with any other, I guess, guiding document that you have in your organization. And I know um, J Jay had a hand in creating the, the Rapid Bright Web, so I'm gonna pass the mic to him. Right on, thank you, Annie, for setting the context so well. Um, I'm glad to not have the pressure of explaining what the heck a rap is. Um, and so I can speak to our example at Bright Web. Um, our intention here is not to hold this up and say this is the way to do it um, or that we've done it perfectly. We took a step um, and we want to share that uh, in transparency in the spirit of hopefully inspiring others uh, along their own journeys. So uh, yes, at BrightWeb, um, you know, uh, going back to about a year and a half ago, um, our leadership team um, said, okay, we need to like deepen and, and clarify our commitments on how we're working with Indigenous communities and improving representation in our field and supporting Indigenous economies. And, and what started from that was looking at, okay, what are some of our peers out there doing? And we actually learned that in the realm of creative agencies, there wasn't really much done, being done yet, unfortunately. That's part of the reason we've tried to been so like um, sharing this as much as we can. Um, but we looked at examples from other organizations. Okay, what are some best practices? Uh, we worked with uh, James Delorme, who a few of you may know, um, dear friend and collaborator to BrightWeb, who gave us a lot of um, fantastic guidance uh, on our approach. Um, and through uh, conversations and reflection, worked towards uh, having a draft of this. So rather than spending forever talking about it, um, we did try to get, like, uh, the leadership team came up with, a, and credit to my colleague Rachel Siegel, who did a lot of the heavy lifting, uh, we came up with a draft to kind of use that as, a, as a, something to discuss with the team. How can we build on this? How can we refine this? 
Um, what resulted is our action plan for 2022 and 2023. So it's not a forever action plan. It's like, what are we doing right now over the next two years to take these next steps? Uh, basically, in our, in, our, in our action plan, um, it lays out um, our, some of the context, uh, why this is important, um, our policy statement around truth and reconciliation, and then a series of strategies uh, that all have actions and commitments connected to them. So what we have are you know, three main tenets. Uh, there's um, cult starting with a lot of like cultural learning for our team, um, for our staff, for our contractors uh, on, on truth and reconciliation and indigenous lens, uh, different perspectives on understanding uh, where we stand on Turtle Island and how we can engage as a company. Um, the, the second one is, uh, is supporting indigenous organizations and businesses uh, as much as we can through our supply cho supplier choices. Um, we're mostly a remote team, but we get together once a year for an annual retreat in person, so making sure that's happening at an indigenous-owned retreat center. Um, so, and then the third one is creating pathways for uh, education and careers. So one of the cool things I'm really excited about right now is I'm creating an indigenous design internship program. Uh, that will be kicking off in 2023. So we know that indigenous uh, creatives, despite the beautiful, fantastic legacy of visual culture here on Turtle Island, indigenous creatives are under, underrepresented in our field. Um, and so we're trying to you know, create, create those pathways through mentorship, through paid internship programs, um, in addition to the existing relationships we already have with some indigenous designers. Um, on that note, I wanna point you here to a couple slides. This is the front page of our reconciliation, reconciliation action plan. Uh, we had the great joy of working with our friend Mariah Mwasiji, um, Anishinaabe Kwe of, of Serpent River First Nation and, and member of the Bear Clan. Um, she's the designer and illustrator that we worked with on this. And um, the, a lot of the, the imagery that, that you, we see woven into this, this piece is inspired by this idea of taking the next step. So kind of like a spark or a seed, here's the next step, and then where does that go? Where, how does that journey grow from there, both as individuals and collectively as a team and as a community. Um, and I would just add to that, um, I was inspired recently by something I heard Annie say in a, in a, in a podcast I was listening to. Um, Annie talked about reconciliation is co-creation. Co-creation. And as someone who creates and whose job title is principal creative director, um, that really struck a chord with me. And truly in our approach with Mariah Moasaji when we created the Reconciliation Action Plan document, it was really co-creation, and we were really mindful of, of creating that, that space for her to bring her perspective uh, as, a, as a First Nations woman, bring her perspective uh, to the themes that we were showing, uh, to the visuals, and also kind of holding that with our visual brand. How does the Bright Web visual brand coexist with, uh, with Mariah's personal uh, expression and vision for this document? So I'm really proud of, of the work that we did together. Um, and yeah, I guess just to highlight, you know, this is like I said for the, you know, the next two years, 2022, 2023, uh, as part of our plan, we have ways to measure progress and check in regularly on that. And then when we come up towards the end of 2023, we'll be looking at, okay, what's next in our cycle? Um, what have we learned? Uh, where have we stumbled? Um, where are we really inspired? And what are the next opportunities? And then we'll, you know, come up with an action plan for the, for the years to follow <coughs> and, and hopefully keep, keep moving forward in a good way on that. Um, you can probably hear a lot of parallels between just being a B Corp and some of that. <laughs> so, um, so I hope you start to see some of the parallel of, of how you, you think about creating impact. Uh, so Lacey, again, you and I had a conversation a while ago on how do you start, you know, and first is getting educated, then getting proximate to the community, working with the community, uh, finding a way to be of service uh, in this co-creation manner, and most of all, following through and being accountable. Uh, for the folks who are B Corps here, that's what you do. <laughs> you know, you went through this rigorous process, you're finding out what is your way to use business as a force for good. The conversation here is kind of widening the aperture a little bit for folks who maybe haven't thought about this as a component of some of that impact um, you all can be creating. Uh, stories are important, so, you know, I guess no profit, no, uh, no impact, no, no story, no message. Uh, so I'll share a little bit from my own experience. Uh, is we uh, convened a bunch of B Corps a few years ago for the B Corp Climate Summit uh, in Taos, New Mexico. Uh, we did our best to involve, engage, uh, co-decide, co-design with the local Pueblo community 
Uh, and I have a, a dear friend, Lila June Johnson, who's a DNA woman, uh, doing a lot of work around food sovereignty and justice, uh, also ran uh, for Congress. Uh, and so she joined us at the summit. Uh, got in good relationship with her, uh, and then my, uh, my sweetheart's on the board of Honor the Earth with Winona LaDuke. And so after we left the summit, they brought me over to the board meeting. These facilitators were just orchestrating this beautiful conversation in a way I had never witnessed before. Uh, and this was at the end of like a three-day long, arduous you know, uh, meeting with a lot of passionate activists who are working very hard. Uh, and I went up to one of them, and you can imagine, that's difficult, right, to go to a facilitator after three days and say, actually, I have a few questions for you. Can I just like, get a little bit more of your time as they're like, taking sticky notes off the walls? Uh, and it was a, 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 a man and a woman named Paul and Leslie. And uh, they run an organization called Indigenous Collaboration. Uh, in Indian country, largely in what's called Colorado now. Uh, got in a relationship with them, followed through, and we continued to kind of check in. And we started talking about what is this legal stakeholder governance that you all are doing around Benefit Corp, and how can it actually maybe apply to land rights and land back and land sovereignty for the Indian country in the US? So it got to next things. So we're like, you know what? We're having this conversation for the SOCAP conference uh, out of San Francisco on legal stakeholder governance. Do you want to join that conversation? And it was beautiful. You know, Paul got in that conversation and started talking about the metaphor of water with fiduciary duty and directors and decision making in the boardroom. And I remember a dear colleague of mine who runs our policy work, just to be real, she sends me a message and says, like, what is he talking about? <laughs> and I was like, good, it's working. Uh, and we've continued to work together. And then he and C. Stanley, who you'll hear from later today, and, and Leslie Cabote, um, said, let's co-create a program around B Corp. And so we create this level program uh, that Lacey from Native Advisor is a part of, and Annie here from Rise Consulting, and a few others here with us today, on thinking through how can we really make sure that we're surrounding and really earning the seat to be in right relationship uh, with indigenous and First Nations-led businesses around the B Corp work. Um, so just a, a little story on how we're on our own learning and unlearning journey, uh, but I hope that B Lab US and Canada can start committing to learning about a reconciliation action plan ourselves and, and be that for our community uh, as well. So I want to I pass that because uh, I think part of this is being put in check uh, or at least asking clarifying questions. So I love, I open this to everybody, but also from uh, Annie and Karen to maybe ask Jay some questions around that reconciliation action plan or did you think of this or maybe some learnings along the way now that you look back. Yeah, I know, I think, and, and I love the storytelling. It's it's important, and, and in this community, right, we get to lean into each other and learn from each other. Um, the connection with B Corp, it, and it was interesting, as, as I was welcomed into this community, and, and even just really found out about B Corp just a few years ago through friends at Shandos Construction, it's nice to feel home. It's nice to feel, you know, what, what you're surrounded by, by people who are interested in the conversation. And and maybe that's that's the question at, at BrightWeb is sort of through the process, did you feel the collective nature within the organization? And, and how did that fuel the momentum for the co-creation of the RAP across the organization? Thanks, Annie. Uh, yeah, I'd say when we set out to do this, there was a hope that it would be really meaningful and important. Uh, and we've actually been, like, it's even, it has become even more important than we had ever imagined or hoped to the team. Uh, and I think part of the, the power of that has been in having these regular uh, calls where we bring in uh, indigenous knowledge keepers to, to share with us their, their perspectives, um, whether it's on sharing their own personal journeys or talking about you know, what, what did my community look like 300 years ago before we were devastated by the impacts of colonization? What work is going on now to revive languages and culture? Um, hearing those, again, stories uh, has been really powerful in making this, like, uh, not just a theoretical thing, but a thing that like, it really strikes a chord with the hearts of our team. And then seeing that that's hap that conversation is happening in parallel to action. Um, that there's ways that the team can contribute to all the different initiatives that we're working on within our, within our action plan. I think I'm going to pass it to you, Karen, but I, I, I think something that I heard from you and, and, and from you as well, Andy, is as you move forward and as you consider this, you know, a couple of really important principles. Reconciliation is relationship. And another 
nothing about you without you, or as indigenous peoples, nothing about us without us. And you can apply that principle in your organization as well. This morning from the main stage, we heard, you know, it's not the role of your DEI practitioner. It's the same as indigenous peoples. You know, it's, you know, I can be in the office somewhere with a client and somebody will like holler out, Annie! Like they want the indigenous person, right? Like to come and help, but it's like, actually, you know, the Honorable Murray Sinclair teaches us this is a team sport. And so, you know, what we just heard from Jay, you know, at BrightWeb or in your own organizations, this isn't meant to be on the desk of one person. You know, reconciliation that needs to be, it needs to be in the hearts of all of us. And so as we spend more time grounding ourselves in truth, that's everybody's doing that. You know, it's not a course for one or two or three or the CEO, it's, it's for everyone and for everyone to come along. And so that communication piece, as you lead this work, as you consider this work, it's really important that everyone in the organization knows they have a role to play. And not, no action is too small. You know, it's this common myth around acts of reconciliation. You know, what can I do? Buying a donut. You know, I think my friend Brianna in the audience is wearing lipstick from Cheekbone Beauty, an indigenous lipstick company that we have in Canada, Karen, for sure is. <laughs> you know, shopping indigenous, training, you know, making commitments in your supply chain. There's so many great ideas that you can sit, consider. And of course, when you bring everyone together, sit in circle, brainstorm, share ideas, you'll be really, really excited to see the ideas that come forward as you ground yourselves in these two principles. Yeah, in, in my conversations, it's really interesting because there's, there's like two camps really of conversations that I have. There's the people who are really not enlightened at all. And they're like, oh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know anything about this. Uh, do you want a beer? <laughs> right? There's that world, which I live in, by the way. <laughs> That's actually where I come from. And then there's the world of this room where you know that you don't know, and you're here to learn, and you know that you have to learn, and you know that you have to take action, but you're so hesitant about doing the wrong thing, right? It's like you have that beer guy over there Frank, uh, <laughs> and then the other end of the spectrum where you guys are like, Should he, I want to help, but I just, I don't, I, you know, and it's, it's like all of it warms my heart. You know, even when Frank says the wrong thing, it warms my heart. Because Frank, although we've maybe painted Frank as being really kind of like blind to all of this, Frank, Frank watches the news. The guy sees the commercials. He knows there's a world changing out there. It's not within his hug range, within his immediate uh, reality, but Frank knows that the world is, is, is twisting and turning, and Frank just doesn't know how to get into it, right? And I just love all of these conversations with everyone, because no matter where you are on that spectrum of readiness, I see the goodwill and the heart and the spirit, are, they're all in the right place to be willing and wanting to do the right things. And so I actually think that in all of the conversations, we're actually more aligned than we think we are. Like, let's not let ourselves defined by, you know, Frank from North Bay, who drinks blue, um, versus the craft beer crew, right? <laughs> we all like beer. Indigenous people alike, right? So like, in all of this, what I like to say is like, we all need to take a step back and just recognize that if we lead with the heart and a good mind and a good spirit, we're gonna get to where we need to be. And it's really not that complicated. And let's invite ourselves to not overthink things. Not saying thinking about it is bad, but sometimes, particularly those of us who've gone through the rigorous training of academia, by golly, those institutions teach you how to just overthink and overcomplicate everything. My dad used to say this to me, just, it's really not that complicated, just keep it simple, right? And so on this front, I think in these conversations about reconciliation action plans, you can have the most complex, beautiful, wrap plan 
But if you do nothing about it, what's, what's, the, you know, what's what? Is there value in that? But if you keep it simple and you do what you can within what's possible for you and your organization, lead with a good heart, a good mind, and a good spirit, the car is going to move forward and we are going to get to a better place. So I want to say, like, yeah, uh, thanks for the encouragement and, like, the walk and the talk is, is really important and, like, you know, just taking those next steps, not waiting until, like, oh, someday I'll be ready for reconciliation and maybe thinking about that, but, like, okay, what is the thing we can do right now? You know, like, for example, even just, like, we talked about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and, like, there's 94 calls to action. Like, it sounds pretty overwhelming, but it actually only takes, like, an hour to, like, flip through um, and get a sense of, like, what they are. And, like, you could do that and, like, be like, oh, which one of these stands out as something that I could talk to my colleagues next week about to, like, where we have the agency to do something about. By the way, uh, call to action number 92 is a cool place for businesses to start. Can I add something? I, so uh, we are encouraged to be interactive, so I'm being interactive. So I'm going to challenge Jay. So Jay said he only really uh, came on his path of enlightenment on reconciliation 10 years ago. Jay grew up literally in my territory. So I would actually say that you've been exercising reconciliation since you were born. And I actually, this I've never asked him this, but we've known each other for a while, so uh, this is a surprise for everyone in the crowd. Please sit on the edge of your seats. Um, <laughs> So just to tell you, physically, there's a lake. It's a pretty big lake. It's called Lake Nipissing. My dad's dad is from Doquise, which is across the lake on a river called the French River. Obviously not its original name. I'm working on that, OK? <laughs> on the French River. Uh, my dad's mom is from Nipissing, which is on the north shore of that lake. Now, on the north shore of that lake is a town called North Bay. And that's where you have all the Scots, the English that came in at the time the railroad was coming across. Everyone moved, railway expansion, cobalt mining, gold mining, tons of mining in northern Ontario. So just setting the scene here for how Jay's people got to my backyard. Um, but I'd be interested to hear from you, Jay, like what was it like growing up there? And maybe not the R word, reconciliation, but when did, you, when did you first recognize that we were cohabitating, we were, we were neighbors essentially on these territories? Oof. Thank you, Karen, uh, I love it. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's an interesting perspective. Uh, you know, growing up on that land, it's like, it totally shaped me. Like, I have a hard time as a settler claiming that as home, but it, when I go to Lake Nipissing, like, I feel home. I grew up near the shores of Calendar Bay, which is the southeast corner. My family has a hunt camp uh, close to the mouth of the French River. Um, and so, you know, every fall growing up, I would take the, the ATVs or the quads uh, with, my, with my family and I'd go back in the bush. Uh, and there was like an awareness of like, oh, there are indigenous folks. Like I had friends in school, like in elementary school in grade seven, like one of my best friends was, you know, lived on first, Nipsing First Nation, but it wasn't, uh, there was definitely a sense of like, I think shame attached to it. Um, I knew that he was indigenous, or back then we used the word native. Um, and we, he didn't really talk about it. Um, we didn't talk about it. We didn't really acknowledge it. And there was never a sense of sort of like a, a welcoming there. Not that I expected it, but like, it just always felt like there was this divide. And I had no idea growing up in this place full of such rich like, legacy and many layers of stories, I had no idea anything about like, the, 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 the deeper underlying stories about colonization or residential schools. Um, I didn't like, really get a gist of that until I was like 22. Um, I mean, I think that's, that's embarrassing, frankly, and I think that points to like, the, big, the big gap that, that we have to make up. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm curious what, if there's anything there that kind of resonates with you and that, or you want me to go deeper on, I'm happy to, happy to yeah, take a follow-up question. Sure. Keep going. Does anyone have a question for Jay on that? Yeah, this is a good moment, actually. I, I forgot to mention that we are being cut short a little bit in our session today, so it's not 75 minutes, it's 60 minutes, because uh, there's a session coming in and they're going to cater lunch uh, and all that, so we'll have to clear up pretty quickly. 
Um, that means we have 10 more minutes. So if there's any questions here for Jay or for anybody else up at the panel, uh, our friend James in the back, I think, has a microphone, or maybe it's next to the donuts. Yeah, he's saying yes. Yeah, they're next to the donuts. Uh, great. There's a few hands raised. Maybe Hughes or someone, if you wouldn't mind, unless you got a question yourself, but hand them to someone. Thank you. And if you wouldn't mind stating your name yeah. uh, and where you're coming from or anything, get us started. Thank you. Great. Hi, I'm Allison. Uh, I am a CEO of Seven Generation. Um, and s so grateful for this conversation today because it's a conversation that we've been having and really need to put intention to as a company. Um, so it's it's great to be with people who are further along on this on this journey. I, I just have maybe a more theoretical question because I'm a little stuck in, in the language because the term reconciliation as an action plan is, is a new combination for me today. Um, and how do you describe the difference between reparation and reconciliation or are those the same thing? That's a really good question. Sorry, can Andy, can I jump in? <laughs> I don't think anybody want to hear from you right there. So, <laughs> so reparation, the way I, so I, I went to law school. I have a background in law. The, so I understand that concept as a legal term. It's to restore the person to the, cl as closest to what they were before the harm was caused. When you think about the, the settlement around residential schools in Canada, there were components of the settlement agreement that did that. So there were monies available, therapies available, uh, continue to be today for survivors, those who are directly impacted by residential school. There was also a legacy component to the settlement that helps to, the, 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 the funds are uh, intended to help restore the common damage that those schools had done. So when you look at, it's act, okay, I'm a total nerd, so I've read the settlement agreement for the residential schools. If you would like to, it's relatively easy read. It's, it's horrible in, in theory, right? But nonetheless, how the whole thing came to be in terms of restoring through legal measures, it's quite interesting as far as it goes for class action settlements. Reconciliation was a part of that settlement. So if you go see, there's actually a schedule there that says Canada will form the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The TRC will do this, this, and this. The Minister of Indigenous Affairs is required to attend these five events. It's not five, I can't remember exactly what number. But the courts played a significant role in moving the country to, as you say, repair the harm that had been caused um, by uh, this terrible federal policy. Um, and so that is a really good question. When you talk about reparation, I think usually you would see it at the individual level. In this particular circumstance, it harmed an entire people. And when you talk about reconciling, um, Annie mentioned um, Murray Sinclair, who's former judge and senator in Canada, and he if you Google him, incredible, incredible insight. He was the chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and he really set reconciling is looking at all of the things that you've worked to repair, but talking about what it means as we go through it in the present, and more importantly, what action we're going to take to making sure that we're repositioning ourselves as a country together. So I think that could actually be like a PhD thesis. Uh, so seventh generation, maybe there's someone at your office who wants to take this on. Um, I think it's, I think it's a, a brilliant question, and we could probably have a whole other session on that next year, actually. And uh, so appreciate the humility with the question, too. Thank you. We probably have time for maybe two or three more. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Tawana Harris. Um, I am from Atlanta, Georgia. And... Um, one thing, I just wanted to say one thing and then ask a question. Um, the first thing is in um, January of 2020, and I'll just be really quick with this, I attended Sundance Film Festival, and there was an amazing conversation about an indigenous advocacy group, and they did a study with Google, and they determined that um, at the end of 2019, 90% of all images of indigenous communities 
on social media had been taken prior to the year 1900. And so with that said, that narrative genocide had been committed against the Native American community, okay? So I wanted to set that frame. The other piece of it is I also found through Ancestry.com that I have a tremendous amount of indigenous um, heritage. The sad part is the indigenous community that I came from was enslaved. Right? And so we have very little track record of what that culture looks like. And so whenever I attend um, the majority of the um, indigenous or native community conversations, none of them look like me, right? And so I wanted to ask a quick question about the representation um, and the conversation where this, I, I'm assuming, I just had this conversation at the Aspen Latina Society event when they were talking about Afro-Latinas and they had representation on stage, but very rarely is there representation and do I see myself represented? And the second part of that is, I don't know enough about my heritage to even say, I have this much blood, right? Because ancestry also does not tell you all of that detail. So when you, don't, when you live in an area where the where the governmental system will not even allow you to gain access to your community, how do we move forward collectively as opposed to these siloed approaches? Really appreciate your question. I was at that session too, at Sundance, actually. So identity and belonging is exploding in Canada. And the Canadians in the room would know this. There are headlines where you have people who have misappropriated identity recently, who have misappropriated identity for the last 20, 30 years. Some, when you dig into it, some of them, like I actually feel bad for some folks who are struggling because it's like they had an uncle or an aunt who played a native person in part, in, you know, in a performance of some sort who kind of like took on that identity. And then that person that's being exposed today grew up thinking truly that their uncle is indigenous. And so when you start unpacking that person's lineage and story, you realize that it came from a place of appropriation. And I think to myself like, God, that's so sad. When you think of authenticity, belonging, identity, your own family's history, your own story, like who you are today and, and what made you who you are today and where you come from, to not have clarity and certainty on that question to me is just one of the fundamental issues of society today. And I don't just mean that from the point of view of an, an indigenous person, I mean it for non-indigenous people. You know, those with fair skin uh, in our current time, I think, we're devaluing those histories. You know, I made friends with uh, a person who immigrated from Ireland five years ago who's now in Canada. We often talk about this and the history of where he comes from and what happened in Ireland and what his ancestors went through, and how because of the color of his skin that gets devalued today, right? And so I take to your question to the room, what comes to me is who are we and where are we from? And I think that, unpacking that question and getting to the source of it, maybe not through government documents uh, and archives, but through connection and conversation with the people around us. So I, I don't know that that's a direct answer to your question, but it's definitely a really important point, I think, for where we are today as a society and where we're headed. And maybe just to build on the first question Andy asked us about, you know, this when, when we sort of started to intersect with, with reconciliation or big R sort of for the first time is that that is such a powerful exercise for yourself and I'll encourage you, you know, the, the lack of resources you've found so far, keep trying, keep having conversation, keep researching because 
our stories connect us and it's so powerful when we share land acknowledgements when i teach about the power of the land acknowledgement it really is to be you know how did you come to be on this land you know what are the the, the steps the days the years the generations and when we feel that and when we learn the stories of those around us it creates that community and it creates health and so thank you for the question and i just wanted to encourage you thank you all um, I'm going to make a decision, unfortunately, to wrap us up. Carla, if you have a quick one, that'd be great. And then it's I'm going to wrap very to quick. honor the. Thank you, Carla. Um, I just wanted to offer I'm Carla Heim from BDC. And uh, BDC has worked with the First Nations University of Canada and Reconciliation Education. Um, and we actually offer the four seasons of reconciliation on our bdc.ca website for free. It's a great um, introductory course to the history and the facts of our, our ancestors. So um, please feel free to log on and take that training. That's all I wanted to share. Uh, thank you. A lot of our team at B-Lab US Canada has actually done some of this for their professional development. So it's a great opportunity for your staff as well. Um, we're going to do a quick um, wrap up of each panelist. And then I'll uh, invite us to wrap up in this way. and then. The one thing I'll ask is if we do actually clear the room once this is wrapped up and we can conti continue conversations uh, outside of that door. Jay, why don't we start with you? Uh, yeah, I'm just like grateful for everyone's uh, everyone's listening and uh, Karen and, and Annie like sharing so humbly like your uh, your perspectives and your great leadership on this. Uh, just like so privileged to be here. Um, I'm happy to chat after if anyone throughout the day tomorrow if anyone wants to kind of uh, talk a bit more about what it might mean in your organization to take the next step. Room, does anyone in this room have a reconciliation action plan in place at their company? So maybe just take a look around the room in case this is another point to connection, another point of connection and just seeing someone else, you know, who can represent another company to kind of keep that conversation going as well. So in the spirit of the holiday season, um, who has seen the movie Elf? Will Ferrell? Like, I love it. Makes me so happy. So there's a part of it before he leaves the North Pole where he goes to Santa's sleigh and um, the main elf that raised him is like flicking the switch of energy, right? And he's like, this thing will fly. We're low on energy, we're low on spirit. And they're like, oh, this is a conundrum. And so earlier I mentioned that humility fuels the vehicle. So it, I'm making an analogy to Elf just in the spirit of the season. I love like the whole marketing media rage on the holidays. It's, yeah, it's not traditional, but that's okay. This is what being indigenous and living in the modern world looks like. So that said, I think um, a thought to reflect on is Santa's sleigh, the vehicle that carries us across uh, the world and into time should be fueled with humility, truth, and courage as we undertake the path of reconciliation. So I'll just leave that with you. And the accountability piece is so important. Those of you that are taking notes or pull out your phone right now, make a commitment to yourself. Tell somebody what that commitment is. It doesn't matter, small or big. Take the course, buy the lipstick, eat a donut. <laughs> Do one thing and then tell somebody because that's the ripple from here. Expand your hug range. Thank you so much. Um, also in the spirit of holidays, today's Giving Tuesday. Uh, so one opportunity is you can, was it yesterday? What's today, Wednesday? <laughs> Whatever, what, what I'm about to say is irrelevant to that. So yeah, give every day, that's good, yeah, yeah. Giving Wednesday. That's good. That's our first laughter of the crew. That's good. Um, so pay rent. You know, it's a good opportunity to find an Indigenous-led First Nations organization that's doing a lot of work here and pay rent for the land we're on. Um, I'm going to switch it up. Instead of a round of applause, because I hope you all feel uh, welcome to do that, is either a palm or a fist on your heart and just eye contact with the folks up here for 15 seconds and let them just kind of gaze around the room and see you all. We appreciate you all being here. Um, please do respect just uh, the request to move out of the room. Uh, we do have catering coming in for a totally different gathering. 
Uh, I just really appreciate you all being here and appreciate you all.